you could, you know, fly up to Waltz in a west day, get up here by the Palisades, thermal up through the turbulence, and <coughs> take the tailwind over here, and then dynamically soar in that west wind. But we, because of the macro rotor of the west, we just don't fly here in a good, in a yeah. strong west. Best conditions is that when we have just light and variable, and in the spring and summer, most people fly here, so it's hard to get a good tailwind because uh, it's usually southwest. There's our but indicator. in the summer, it's climbing. In the summer, we get southeast. Uh, so no one flies here in the southeast because it's too violent. It's starting, it's starting to cycle it's starting a little bit. Starting to change a little bit. Yeah, yeah. and that yeah. is what right. we want. Right. It's showing us that it's not wind, but cycle. Just introductory wings or student wings, and then there's aerobatic wings for doing acro oh, tricks, that, yeah. and then there's cross country wings for doing long distance. I mean, there's many more like speed wings and hybrids and every other, you know, hike and fly, lightweight, ultralight. But out here, predominantly, we fly cross country because this is just it's one of the more advanced forms of paragliding, and it's perfect for our topography in our area like so a cross-country wing is slightly different and a norm from a normal paraglider and that the aspect ratio is increased so it's wider than it is long or deep and they will often have a ratio a normal paraglider will be about five to one five times wider than it is deep uh, my wing is seven and a half to one John Blake, J O N B L A K E. We'll see you down there, Dan. Yeah, for Thanks lunch. for driving. Malcolm Swan from, I guess, San Diego, California. <laughs> you guess? No, I'm moving to Seattle soon. I'm a so. Capricorn. So, I like long walks yeah, on the beach. and Thai food. Yeah. <laughs> I'm moving to <laughs> Seattle in a month. Oh, really? So, How come? Uh, for residency. I finished medical school going into residency. All right. And anesthesiology. Uh-huh. So. A lot of people think paragliding, we just go up a mountain and glide down. Uh, that's worst case scenario. <laughs> Best case scenario is that we find lift and take the thermals up. And right now we're standing at 8,000 feet above sea level. We're in the White Mountains and the valley floor is 5,000 feet. So we have just over 8,000 or 3,000 vertical feet for that air to warm. And we're going to launch into the rising warm air. And on a good day, right here, I can be taken up to 17, 18,000 feet in a few minutes in a good rising thermal. 
once you get your desired amount of altitude or as much as you can until you get to our 18,000 foot FAA limit, then normally we take this south wind as a tailwind and we glide north. And from this direction, we can make it to Nevada in about 25, 30 miles in approximately an hour or two, depending on your wing and the tailwind. So on a good day, we'll fly down to Nevada, 25 miles, tag Boundary Peak, turn around and fly back. Flying back usually is a little slower. It will take two or three hours instead of one or two because we have to penetrate into the headwind. Our gliders aren't very fast. We have no motor. And so we're really susceptible to wind. If it's just a couple miles an hour, it's not a big deal. But 10, 15 miles an hour wind is a real big deal when your aircraft only goes 25, 27 miles an hour on average. It seems uh, uh, counterintuitive to be able to fly against the wind. Right, but so does sailing into the wind. Seems counterintuitive, but you learn to tack. You know, just like a sailor learns his tool, his boat, and you learn to fly or sail upwind, same thing with the paraglider. Uh, it's completely different in principle, but we are capable of flying upwind. Sometimes, um, it's not sometimes, but it is much more difficult to fly upwind. That's why this area is really famous for cross-country flying, because in our warmer months when we have good thermals, we also will get a good south wind. So if you start at the south end of the mountain range and you launch with that good south wind and if it's really thermic and you can keep finding lift, every time you find lift, you fly north in that tailwind. Find more lift, fly north. The stronger the tailwind, the further you go on your transitions or your glides. So on a good day, you can fly over 100 miles. And right now the state record is 172 miles uh, from me two or three years ago from Waltz Point up towards Reno. Uh, I didn't make it to Reno, that's where I was trying to go. I made it to Yearington, Nevada, which is kind of parallel with South Lake Tahoe, but out in the Nevada desert. And that 172 mile flight was seven and a half hours. Uh, max altitude, 17,800 feet. And it was over the Sierra the entire time until the Glass Mountains. And then I went around the east side of Mono Lake, over Bodie, and then out to Yearington on those desert ranges of Nevada. And in a nutshell, it all boils down to temperature. And if you imagine, if we look out here, imagine the air as layers, just like layers of a cake. Well, every thousand feet of altitude, the air gets cooler as it goes up. So it's hotter down in Bishop than it is here. And the difference in the temperature differential between each thousand foot layer is what we call the lapse rate. So we need a, a steady rate of cooling through each layer of air. Warm air will only rise if it's surrounded by cold air, just like a hot air balloon. You have to heat the air up in that balloon to get it to rise. Now, if, if a rising parcel of air, of warm air, it will rise as long as it's surrounded by cold air, but as soon as it encounters a warm layer, it stops rising. So that's what our inversion layers are. When we get those hard inversions, where you see all the air being held down by the high pressure, that's holding the thermals down. And on a lot of the days, uh, we don't have enough temperature difference between the layers to even create the thermals. So what we need is a minimum of three degrees colder for every thousand feet we go up, or 10 degrees for every thousand meters. Thermals originate from the heat of the sun down low on the mountain. The mountain heats up from the, the solar radiation through the heating. Well, that heat starts to collect and heat rises. So it wants to go up. But the surface tension, um, without going into the physics, holds the heat to the, sur to the surface, just like water can run down your arm the heat will actually run up the slope without releasing until it gets strong enough to release or hits a peak top to release on its trigger point. Either way, the warm air will rush up, it will release, and that's the point where the thermal is truly born is when it releases from the slope. You can think of a thermal as a rising, cyclonic, spinning column of air, similar to a dust devil or a tornado, but instead of having extreme uh, horizontal energy, it's mostly focused it upward. So it does rotate, 
Um, and depending on the hemisphere, the northern and southern hemisphere and the conditions, they often will rotate one way or the other. Um, but that's not always the case and that's still up for debate. But they are, they do rotate, so they do have a grain to them. If you turn in it one way, it will feel different than if you're turning the other way. And there's a more efficient way to turn that's against the grain of the, of the thermal. And so you'll see really professional XC pilots get in the thermal, turn, swap, turn the other way, and figure out which way climbs better. Sometimes you'll climb at 300 feet per minute one way, 320 the other. Not a big difference, but if you're climbing for eight minutes and going to 16,000 feet, that will give you a little bit more time to go on your glide, more distance covered. Thermal flying is all about efficiency and learning how to use your climbs and your transitions to gain maximum distance. And understanding the weather and the topography and how the thermals work is basically 101 for paragliding. You can't come out here without having a basic knowledge of everything. Uh, you don't have to understand everything 100%, but you have to be able to evaluate everything basically I just touched on, on your own. That's like the sound of the wind.